everyone, welcome back to Coachy TV. Um, we'll return to um, workouts for the specific prep um, phase here later on in the next couple days, but I wanted to take a second to look at um, something that I think is really important in anything that you're doing, not just for an individual workout, for your microcycles, um, or anything, just the entire season overall. It's just always knowing your why. Um, and that'll make a little bit more sense um, when we get a little bit into it. And really sort of the jumping off point for this came from a couple of messages that I saw on um, Twitter and a few other um, places um, about uh, the way um, just some coach I don't really necessarily know was treating um, secrecy when it came to particular workouts and it really kind of inspired me to kind of look at this a little bit more so when we get into actually um, looking at some of the workouts I'll explain that a little bit more so but really just knowing your why is going to be the topic of um, discussion here and essentially for season planning and that goes into you know obviously your your phases your microcycles and your individual workouts um, that you're doing so the idea is we're going to be dispelling the myths about some kind of secret workouts and creating the right plan for your current team the way i'm going to do that is tell you how i've created plans for one team that was very different the specific team that you're seeing right here the 2018 wharton boys cross country varsity team um this was a week before um our first race of the season that year and then how um, you know, I, I believe in the same things and everything here two years later with my 2020 team and how I really planned a very different look at the summer training here because the why um, we were doing things was different. You know, what they needed was different between these two teams and I'll show you when I break down the difference between these two teams and why we're doing those things, um, you know, is really important to kind of illustrate in anything that you're doing. I'm Kyle DeJocano, the head boys cross country and track coach at Wharton High School in Tampa, Florida, and I have been for the last seven years. If you'd like a closer look at some of my credentials, they are on the screen. Okay, so um, essentially, just to briefly sort of look at this, the macro cycle includes five parts, right? We've talked about this in previous videos. Um, there's a transitionary phase where you have rest and recovery between your seasons. This is probably what was going on for most people in May as um, they were finishing up um, or you know, the season was finished up for us. Um, the track season and then getting into the cross country season, I have a video in the description down below that talks about that. General preparation phase, I did a whole um, probably 10 or 15 videos on this, um, planning it in the workouts, and basically general prep is just prepping for more intense work later on. The video series I've been working on currently is about specific preparation phase, typically what people start getting into in August time frame. And it's just specifically um, preparing for the demands of the race, pre-comp phase, preparing for the most important meets. This is where the hardest workouts of the season happens. And the competitive phase is where big-time races, the races dictate what you're doing. So that is the general idea of what you're doing in the five key parts of the season. Four of those are workout-related, and one of them is rest and recovery. But the thing here is, however, what each of these workout phases, the, the two through five um, ones listed here, they look, they should be in part dictated by your current team and a few other things that are, are going on here. So general preparation phase for um, one team is gonna have similarities, but it's gonna have different pieces and focuses based on the team you're dealing with um, and some other key aspects that you definitely need to know um, as you're figuring out what your why is for, again, your individual workout, your microcycles, your phases, and your overall season. And so kind of illustrate that, I'm going to kind of take us through a, a hypothetical workout example. This is one that should be very, um, you know, noticeable things that um, I've talked about in some previous videos, general prep, um, and we'll just kind of see how, how this plays out. So hypothetical workout example. Say we've got VO2 max, also called um, aerobic power, aerobic power, the, the more correct name for it, but VO2 max is used quite often too. Intervals times five 1200s, which would be 6,000 total meters. Let's say that you did that with your team and the intensity was 98 to 101 percent of current VVO2 max, which is the desired intensity for peripheral VO2 max development. Let's say you you decide we're going to do rest as, um, as active recovery, so jogging, so it clears any of the acid that developed on each rep, and that the actual rest time is going to be about equal to the time on, which is typically what you would want for um, aerobic power or VO2 max intervals equal work to time on um, interval meaning incomplete recovery but so they can get the whole 6,000 meters of two mile pace so they're getting you know um, almost double two mile um, they're getting almost double two mile work um, they would be able to do straight through and then you're gonna end with a three mile cooldown my question is is this a good workout okay We've got a lot of the parameters we're dealing with here. High school kids for intervals for aerobic power. Typically, you say between 4,000 meters and 9,600 meters. I like for 
especially for high school boys and then your in your good um, high school girls around 6,000 meters a high school boy can do you know sometimes four times mile sometimes it's five times 1200 um, six times um, thousand depending on the actual time we've got um, active recovery um, equal time on and we've got the intensity that is best training peripheral vo2 max and a three mile cooldown so we've got a good clearing of any acid it seems like everything on this would make a lot of sense so is this a good workout but the real answer here, even though it checks a lot of the boxes for what would be a vo2 max aerobic power workout the real answer is that is impossible to say to look at that in isolation and say if this is a good workout for you know your current situation what event are you getting ready for who is on your team what have you already done before that it, it's impossible to say by just looking at the one day workout details so some of the questions you have to ask is what event are we getting ready for are, are we getting ready for the 10k um 10k is really not you know dictated by you know peripheral vo2 max it's really important for um you know the the 5k and, and the 3200 meters um it's pretty important for the mile and the 800 but if you're trying to get ready a 400 meter runner well this is probably not a great workout either they're probably not going to be able to get to 6,000 meters as a 400 meter runner if you're trying to get ready for the half marathon again it really doesn't make sense to be working at this kind of intensity because it's not specific also super important to consider is who is the athlete being trained i mean chronological age um meaning how old are they actually but what is their training age is this a high school senior who's first year on the team or is it a high school sophomore who's been training since they were in sixth grade those are two very different situations um you know what are their strengths and weaknesses is this, is this an aerobic monster who just you know eats this type of stuff up or is this more of a middle distance runner that you're trying to expand their their volume so that they can be better at what makes them great um also consider um what was your why for the day what were you trying to train um you know meaning why were you doing this if you were trying to train peripheral vo2 max well this is a pretty decent workout just answering that one why for the day not answering these other things but if you were trying to train running economy you can get a little bit of that just from um any type of running you can get more economy but this is not going to target running economy if you're trying to target you know speed you would never do you know vo2 max to get somebody you know truly anaerobically faster there's some anaerobic contributions here but this is the fastest aerobic pace if you're just trying to get somebody central vo2 max development if you're trying to just get somebody generally into shape well there's a lot of workouts that are way better than this and if you try and throw somebody into this early on before they've got um some miles on them some central vo2 max development then this workout is probably not going to be successful because they just aren't going to be able to complete it so the why for the day is really important and what part of the training year are we in um this to me feels like i mean just you know today is um july 9th we did this very workout with a bunch of my kids um on monday july 6th yeah july 6th with a lot of my group i would say probably the the top um in terms of pace um two-thirds of the kids another group that um their their time for it is a little bit um slower so you know you have to break it up a little bit six times um 600 and we even had another group that was doing um seven times 800 so you know very close in terms but it was kind of changing it for what it was so here in general prep about you know getting into the second half of general prep that might be good um it's still going to be important even in the beginning of specific prep potentially depending on what your team is and, and what you're looking for um through specific prep but if this is the week of the state meet this probably is not what you're going to be doing you're not going to be doing intervals you're probably going to be looking for more repetitions or, or something like that so if you're not thinking about all of these things it's impossible to say looking at this in isolation if it's a good workout or a terrible workout and this is sort of bringing up that point about the, the myth of you know secret workouts and the reason why I wanted to do this is I saw um, posted in a couple different places it was a, a college athlete I've never heard of before but it just kind of blew up and I saw it and it was something about they, their coach did not want them posting the workouts to Strava because they were basically treating workouts as secret intel and that just doesn't make any sense to me um you know there is no perfect workout if you go and see somebody's workout on strava you should not go and try and replicate that because you've not asked all of these questions of that person and what they're doing 
you know, you might think they're doing one thing and something completely different is going on. You know, you have no idea what their situation is, what they're trying to accomplish, what their why was for the season, for that phase, for that week, all those different things. You know, there's no perfect workout. There's only the right workout for the right events the right athlete at the right time. If you're not treating this, I mean, again, if you're looking at, you know, a, a, an athlete who is getting ready for a completely different event, it makes no sense to look at it. And how do you know that just by looking at a, a secret, you know, workout that got posted on Strava or, or some other place? And, and in reality, to me, really, just looking at any one workout in isolation, it, it might as well be in a foreign language. Like, it, it should mean almost nothing to you. You don't know what they you know, what they had done, you know, three days before. You don't know what they're planning to do three weeks from now. You don't know what they did a month ago. And you don't know what they were really trying to work on or what their why was um, for any of those things. So, you know, don't really, you know, try and, and, and go into these things trying to figure out what the perfect workout is. A lot of the, the videos I've put out have really tried to figure out this idea of, of your why. And, you know, here's some parameters, but you got to figure out your situation, how it's going to work for you. Um, you know, it, it's great to read something um, in a book and read an account of somebody, but if you don't, you know, know why somebody did a workout or, or whatever and, and why they were trying to do it, what they were trying to accomplish, all those different things, it just really doesn't make a lot of sense to try and treat any of this stuff as, like I said, as like some kind of secret intel or something like that. You know yourself if you're training yourself as an athlete and you know your team as well as anybody. Only you can say your situation, what you're looking at, what you're trying to accomplish and why you're doing all those things. Don't just try and pick up a random workout and say, oh, I'm going to do eight times, you know, 400 at, you know, 60 just because I saw that this one coach is really successful. You have no idea what that coach was trying to do, why they were doing it, um, who they're trying to train, what event they're, maybe you know the event they're training for, but all these different things are going into place and you really have to kind of dissect it. When I first started looking at... Um, some kind of uh, a, a trainings to, to kind of expand myself um, as a coach. You know, as I started sitting there, I was, you know, you know, some of these trainings were, were multiple days long. And when I first went, I was like, all right, so when are we going to get to the workouts? When are they going to tell me about these these fantastic workouts that these great coaches that sat down and and are presenting this and they, they gave me all the science and all these different, you know, coaching theory type of things. But when are we going to get to the workouts? And, you know, the first one I went to, I was kind of disappointed at the beginning to leave with no workouts. In fact, the lead presenter um, of, of this, uh, he, he would actually, if people go, hey, I'm going to do this workout, and he would always say, that could be a great workout. That could be a fantastic workout, but could also be a terrible workout. You know, he, as he listens to him, it's like, you know, that, that sounds like it would be a great, and, and you know if it's going to work for your situation. Just understand, you know, what that's going to do to the person, what part of the year you're in, why you're doing it for the event and the athlete and all those different things. And I left a little bit, you know, confused and disappointed initially because I was like, well, I thought I was going to leave with this repertoire of just fantastic workouts that I could just pick from. But in reality, it gave me the tools to craft what made sense for me in my situation because, you know, somebody who's maybe coaching a team in North Dakota is not going to deal with the, the things that I'm dealing with here in Tampa, Florida. You know, we're, we're not going to see 60 degrees again until probably maybe November. Hopefully by our state meet in September, um, excuse me, uh, November 7th, we might see 60 degrees again, but I'm not going to count on it. It might not happen. And we've also got crazy humidity all the time that, you know, they obviously can get, you know, fairly hot in, in, you know, the Dakotas or Montana or any other place that's way, way far away, but they're going to be dealing with something completely different. They have to deal with, you know, relative hills on their runs and things like that, that we have to actually travel to even find hills here for our different strength type workouts. So, um, it actually, in the end, ended up being great, and I'm glad they didn't try and show us, you know, these are the workouts that you should be doing right here. Um, and anything that I've sort of presented, I've always said, you know, these are very hypotheticals. These are things that you could be doing. Um, but I always try to explain why I'm planning to do these things with my 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 kids, the kids that I work with. So hopefully you can apply that for, for you and your situation. All right, so I think there's three plus one important things to know first before you really start doing anything. And actually, this is a conversation I have with one of my athletes who um, is, is thinking of um, pursuing a career in um, either um, being a sports psychologist or a coach or, or something like that. And they wanted to kind of know some more things so they can start developing their own coaching philosophy. And, um, you know, they're about to go off to college here in, in the next month or so. And so this is kind of fresh in my mind. And these are the kind of things that I talk to them about. So three plus one. 
okay, to kind of know first. Three things that are kind of overarching that you should always kind of go through in terms of, I think, order of importance. And then the plus one is something that should always be sort of in the background or kind of in the periphery that you're always thinking about also. So I think the first thing um, to consider is what are the demands of the race, okay? That is critical. You know, what are the demands of the race, you know, what are the, the biggest win predictor? You know, who wins and who loses? And there are some studies that have really looked at this, um, specifically from the 800 out to the 10K. There, there's a, a, you know, a fantastic um, study that was I've referenced many times, produced, uh, first released in 2008 by Ingham and been sort of subsequently, you know, held up. You know, so what does it take to win the 5K? And is that different than what it takes to win the 800? And if you know what the biggest win predictor is, well, you better hit that area hard figure out how to expand that area as much as possible with some some targeted workouts. Also, some what, what are the, the basic race metrics, right? What is the intensity it's run at? Um, what are the energy contributions, you know? If you, you might sit down and, and maybe you're training, um, just for an example, a 400 meter runner. And obviously 400 is, you know, a mostly anaerobic race, but if you also knew that the aerobic system contributed, you know, about 40% of the energy in, 40 to 45%, depending, high school girls typically a little bit more because the race is longer, high school boys and, and then college men and, and women get to be a little bit less, um, you know, you might, you know, try and figure out a way to get some more aerobic work in there that might not be completely intuitive um, for the 400 and, and things like that. So that's kind of really important, the basic race metrics. What, is, you know, what does it take to win the race, but what does the race constitute it of too, right? So also, some other things that are a little bit more um, in depth. Um, things that I share sometimes in, in this presentation, which is what's the relative acid level at race pace? You know, obviously the race, you know, race pace acid level of the 800 is gonna be much higher than the 10K. Um, so do we have to kind of consider that when we're doing our anaerobic type um, training to get ourselves ready to neutralize and buffer the acid? That's something that might be considered too. And, and how does the peaking work for this race? Because the way the 800 meter peaks is different than the way the 5K peaks and the way the 10K peaks, and, and that needs to be considered also. So that's the first thing. What's the race, right? Um, that's really important. And when I ask this of... Um, this one athlete, and actually there were two athletes, one athlete who's still in high school who wanted to learn a little bit more about it. This was not the first thing that came to mind because it's, this next one I think is because you always want to consider who the athlete is. And I thought that was important too, that they were, they were thinking along these same lines, right? They're not, you know, thinking first of workouts. They're thinking first of, you know, what's going on, you know, what you're training, but they were also thinking about who they were training, which is also really important. And I think the second most important thing. Um, the reason why I put this first, because if you know the athlete, but you don't know what you're training for, well, that doesn't really make a lot of sense. You really need to know the event first and then figuring out who the athlete is, fitting the demands of that race that you're, you're trying to get them ready for. So we already talked about this a little bit, things like training age and chronological age. Is this somebody who, and when we, um, when we, when we talk about chronological age too, you know, is this somebody who's potentially, you know, have they, is, is it a, a, a guy who has, you know, their voice has gotten deeper, they've gone through puberty, or is it more of a late bloomer who maybe is hitting puberty a little bit later? That's going to change things because they, if they're a late bloomer, they may not have, you know, some of the strength gains that, that they're really dealing with yet. Um, that's sort of important to look at too. What other kind of training things have they looked at? You know, other athletic experiences. Are they a triathlete? Um, so they have maybe a lot of aerobic capacity. Maybe they haven't done a lot of targeted, maybe VO2 max work or something like that. They've done a lot of bulk types of things. Is this somebody who's a soccer player and maybe has really good, you know, technical footwork and things like that, that, you know, maybe they've got some other things that they can also offer um, in their training that you might want to also consider. And obviously you want to know their strengths and weaknesses. Is this somebody that lends themselves more to volume? Are they somebody that likes more of the faster, quicker stuff? Are they somewhere more in the middle? What type of athlete is this? What are their strengths and weaknesses? And once you have those two things down, the demands of the race and who it is you're training, you need to know your why, okay? Overall, know your why for each day, for each phase, and season overall, right? So that idea of um, understanding, you know, everything you're doing, you know, why are you doing it? If you don't know this, do not attempt the workout or don't attempt to plan your season yet. Figure out your why first. This is something, um, I'm actually a language arts teacher um, at, at Wharton High School also. Um, my primary gig 
And, you know, one of the things I always talk about in my classroom is, all right, guys, the what is is an important thing, right? What you're doing is important, but it's really that basic level of things. Why you're doing something always makes it more impactful. You know, whenever um, maybe I ask a question here, or even if I'm, you know, dealing with it at practice and we say, what are we doing today? Okay, why? Why are we doing this? We need to be able to articulate that. We need to know why we're doing something. And if you know why you're doing something in, you know, your English class, you know, at, at your job, you know, and at, in your training session, if you know why it's being done, you're going to put a whole lot more into it because you really know that, that why. That's so powerful. Why you're doing something just really gives, you know, that ability to go after it and, and be more cognizant of, you know, hey, you know, the wind predictor in this race is this, and this workout is directly targeting it. I know why I'm doing this. I better give my all here and, and really hit the targets, whatever it is you're doing. So those are the three things that I think are the overreaching that you really have to consider um, as you're doing it. Race demands, who the athlete or athletes are you're training, and knowing your why for that day, phase, and the season. And it's sort of that plus one element that always has to be sort of in the periphery, something that's you know, you're keeping your eye on as you're doing it, is the law of training specificity, okay? Every training session, I've talked about this in, in a lot of um, presentations, so it shouldn't be brand new stuff. Every training session has a specific effect on the athlete. You do workout A, training effect A is gonna happen. They're gonna adapt in this way, okay? You do workout B, training effect B is going to happen, okay? If you do workout A, B is not necessarily going to happen. Only A is going to happen. That idea of you give your body something, it adapts only to what you give it, and it will not adapt to what you're not giving it. In fact, if you stop doing something that was important, it's going to adapt away from it at some point. That's this whole idea. Um, that's actually another training law called law of reversibility that I don't really want to get into here, but um, law of training specificity, specific effect on the athlete, every training session. And here's the critical point. Okay, because I think that people lose sight of this, which is even more important. That specific training effect from the training session, which may or may not be desired for the event. Okay, really interesting there. Just because you're training, just because you're running, doesn't mean you are getting yourself, the athlete we're talking about here, ready for the demands of the race that we're talking about. You may be making yourself a little bit worse, okay? And actually, the, the very athlete that I was mentioning at the very beginning who's going off to college, um, before I started working with this person, you know, was doing a lot of things that were sort of half marathon based. You know, they were doing these intensities that were getting close to like 82% um, VO2 max. So it's like a, a hard recovery run, a hard long run and that kind of thing. But And those workouts, fantastic for getting yourself ready to use fat at a higher intensity, which is what you need for half marathon and marathon. It's so you don't hit that wall after two hours because your body needs to be able to spare the faster fuel of, of stored glucose. That Those workouts were fantastic for half marathon, marathon. The problem was this athlete was trying to get ready for the 5K. And the 5K has a completely different set of demands than the half marathon and marathon. So if you're trying to get ready for the half marathon and marathon, great. Think about the demands of the race, who you're training and your why, and the law of training specificity will take you to a specific type of workout. But that same workout plan is not going to work for a 5K or an 800 or something like that. So that idea of this plays into count when you're dealing with the demands of the race, okay, who you're training, and why you're doing it. So that's why this is sort of that plus one that kind of crosses over into all these different areas. So if you keep these three plus one things in mind before you start planning your stuff out, you're going to be in really good shape. Um, so that's sort of the important thing um, to, to really sort of consider before you start trying to create any workouts and things like that. And in fact, as I mentioned, the, the trainings that I went to, um, these, th these uh, two kids who wanted to learn more about coaching, I think, and, and they said this after the fact, they were expecting, you know, tell me about the best workouts, you know, what's the order of important of workouts and things like that. And we did not discuss any workouts um, when we sat down and we talked about this and, and subsequently since we've talked about these things. Um, this was the important thing, knowing your, your whole thing. If you want to be a coach, knowing your, your why, your philosophy, but most importantly, the demands of the race, who the athlete is, figuring out your why, which kind of has to do with your philosophy, and know that law of training specificity. All of those things are just critically important before you start looking at anything else. So since the majority of the world is getting ready for a cross-country 5K season um, at the high school level and the collegiate level, um, 
I thought it would be an, a good idea for me to kind of go through some of these things that we just talked about, the race demands, um, the athlete, and, and knowing your why. With the cross-country 5K, it just kind of makes sense to kind of see how this would all sort of play out. So, um, one of the things in terms of um, race metrics for the 5K I talked about is knowing, you know, what the win predictor is. And this is the study I talked about before, 2008. Dr. Ingham released this, a fantastic study. They looked at a bunch of different things to figure out who won the 5K and who came up a little bit short. And what they found is there was a single indicator of who has the best VO2 max, 94.3% of the time. Whoever has the most, the, the, the highest VO2 max can use the most oxygen um, and at, at faster intensities wins the 5K, which makes perfect sense if you think about the length of this race. Um, you know, it, it is about who can go fast aerobically so that, you know, and you've seen it all the time probably in a 5K. You've got, you know, a couple athletes who, you know, through the first mile, they look like they're, they're you know, they're all fine, but then it, it sort of, you know, a couple people kind of fall back and they just look like they're dead at the end because some of those people were running at VO2 max or a little bit slower and some of those people were getting too much energy from their anaerobic like aerobic system, they had acid that fatigued them at the end. So if you're looking at this for maybe the 800, it would be very different. In fact, in, in that one, there was a covariant. They looked at two different things together that, that got the win predictor. But if you're looking at the 5K, then we know, okay, VO2 max is going to be the most important thing that we have to target. We have to get to that. There are a couple things that make up VO2 max. I've already mentioned it in this presentation, presentation, central versus peripheral VO2 max. And where your team is might be different about how you're going to train or develop somebody's VO2 max throughout a season. If we look at the, uh, U the USATF distance uh, curriculum, um, we will find that um, race-specific VO2 max, the intensity essentially, the 5K is run at 97% VO2 max, very close to your two-mile pace, which is one of the best tests for um, VO2 max in the field or the VVO2 max, the velocity at which you reach VO2 max. So again, one of the reasons why this is so close, um, you know, why this is such big in terms of who wins the race is probably because of relatively how fast um, the 5K is run in terms of it being very close to VO2 max. So 97% of it, just a little bit slower than, than two mile pace. And this is the other thing we talked about, energy contributions. Um, study that was released by Dr. Matter and Dr. Hartman in 2018, and they looked at a bunch of different races, I think from the 30 meters all the way out to the marathon, and I pulled out 5K here. Um, the They found that, and this was not some of the old older studies that looked at the end of the race and measured lactate levels or looked at calories burned and things like that. This was something that was actually measuring it sort of as a almost second by second at different intensities to see where it was coming from. So it's not, you know, running a 400 and then measuring lactate levels and saying, oh, well, lactic acid is, is, is the highest at the 400. But what they actually found, and not to get too sidetracked here, is that the, the, the anaerobic glycolytic system kind of tapped out after 120, 140 meters in, in the people they studied. Now the acid level kept going up, but marginally it went up higher in that first 120 to 140 or so meters. So it really was interesting to look at it. It really gave a better idea of what this, what, um, you know, how this actually plays out. And in the 5K, what they found was 4% of the energy came from the alactic system or the ATP that's sitting in their muscles um, at the start. And then the phosphocretin, which is the fastest way of recharging energy. I actually did a whole video talking about anaerobic pace summaries where I talk about these two ways energy is produced. Um, I'll put it in the description down below. It might be of interest. 10% of the energy from the anaerobic glycolytic system. A little bit slower, um, but still fast producing energy system that does cause acid. And 86% of the energy, no surprise here, comes from the aerobic system um, with such a long race um, of, of over three miles. That doesn't, that's not at all surprising. This is at race pace. If you went out and you walked a 5K, it would be like 99% aerobic. There's gonna be these energy cont contributing factors are always going to be on. So um, this is at race pace, obviously. So those are some of the metrics. And again, I wanna always keep the law of training specificity in mind. Again, every training session specific effect on the athlete, which may or may not be desired for the event. So for this, what you probably wanna consider is how do we use these metrics to create workouts to improve 5K success? Well, we already said it. We better figure out how to target VO2 max in some way. As, as I said, there's a couple different ways you can target it. This kind of bears in very much so with the intensity here. So as we're training VO2 max, we're pretty much almost targeting race pace here. And that fits in perfectly with what we're seeing here that most of the energy is coming from the aerobic system. So it looks like VO2 max is going to be really, really critical. Other elements that would be different if we looked at say the 10K, running economy, which is a different type of workout type. So 
again, keep, keep kind of the focus on where it is. If we're looking at the 5K, VO2 max is critical, feeds in with the idea of the aerobic system. So, you know, that's what we really want to kind of look at when we're creating some of these workouts. Getting a little bit more in depth, as I mentioned, relative acidity levels is really important, especially when you start getting into anaerobic workout in specific prep. Most people, that's going to happen sometime in August. Um, so the relative acid levels, and as I mentioned, um, the anaerobic glycolytic system is on. Even if you're if, if you're asleep, you're going to be creating energy with anaerobic um, glycolysis. You just watching this presentation, you're producing energy with anaerobic glycolysis. Um, but it's not going to be accumulating until after a lactic threshold. So you're always going to have some of this in your system. Lactic threshold is about 2.5, 10K, 7.5 millimoles of lactate. And then the 5K is at 7 millimoles of lactate. So what we would find here is that the 5K is, you know, kind of close to the 3200 meter. But it's also pretty close to the 10K here. But the idea being, if we were to go back and we were to look at a couple other things, we would find that the 10K is a little bit different almost because of the length of it. This actually is, if you look at all the metrics of these three races, you would find that the 5K is going to be closer to the 3200 meter. Obviously, this is going to be run faster. It's a shorter distance. And when you take into account all the different metrics of the race, these two are going to be really close when you go and look at wind predictor for the 10K. <coughs> Excuse me. And the idea that this is longer. So this is higher level not necessarily because of the intensity but really because this race is twice as long as this one if that kind of makes sense and if you were trying to get ready for the 400 man you better be doing some really hard anaerobic work here at some point um but as i said if you looked at the actual metric of the 400 there's some other things that you're going to have to do also so if you're training your 800 meter kids say in the track season with your 3200 meter kids and you're doing the exact same workouts well somebody's getting short changed here right these people need to get ready for 12 millimoles of lactate, one of the things they have to get ready for, while these people have to get ready for almost twice that amount. Are they getting way too much acid buffering capacity to where you know it's hurting their aerobic system, or are these people not getting it and they're going to look jelly-legged and dead on lap two? So these are things to kind of consider as you're creating these workouts um, for, for either yourself or whoever it is you're training. Law of training specificity jumps back in here, every training effect, um, specific effect and it may or may not be designed for the event. So for this one, we really want to think of how do we create workouts designed to have the athlete buffer the acid at race pace, you know, that specific race pace, how can it buffer it? In the 10K, how's it going to buffer it over, you know, 6.2 miles, which is different than the faster accumulation of acid that happens in the 5K in half as amount of time. And the 3200 meter, again, even higher acid level, and you know, a third of, you know, sorry, uh, two thirds the amount of time is the 5K. So those are all things that you need to consider as you're thinking about, you know, the workouts you're doing more in the second half of the season when you get into specific prep. And then last up, I talked about the idea of, of peaking time frames is gonna be different for different races. So let's go ahead and look at this, and these are things you need to kind of consider too. And something else that's interesting is that males and females peak differently based on a key strength hormone in, that each of them have at, at you know at different um, different levels. So males are more based on testosterone, their their strength gain. I'm not I don't think I'm breaking any um, news to anybody here. You know, obviously um, girls or, or women, depending on the age group you're training, have some testosterone, but boys and, and men are going to have way way higher levels of testosterone in them, which testosterone the key strength hormone for males peaks with a pretty good reduction in volume you know maybe 30 percent less volume in your, your your competitive phase the peaking phase i typically would say about three weeks um or so in say the 5k um it's going to be a little bit different for some of these different races females um girls or, or women depending on the age frame you're looking at it's more based on human growth hormone now Males obviously also produce human growth hormone, but a, it's more important to the strength gain for girls and, and women than it is for men. It's, it's important for, for men and, and boys also, but it's more important here for, for um, girls and, and women because they don't have testosterone as the, you know, their, their key strength um, hormone. However, this can drop with large volume reductions. HGH is sort of influenced with activity. You know, your body is, is releasing human growth hormone to repair what you're doing. 
So if you start giving um, you know, your, your girls or your women's team a whole lot less volume in the peaking phase, well, they're going to lose a lot of their key strength hormones. So you know, a lot of times I think this is sort of looked at in reverse, and they think that, well, maybe you know, girls and women you know, don't respond as well to higher volume. In the peaking phase, it's the exact opposite. You know, girls and women should actually keep their volume a little bit higher because of this key fact that HGH is where they're getting a lot more of their strength gains. Men and boys they're going to respond better to a slightly um, in, uh, a slightly um, more substantial decrease in volume because of the way testosterone is affected by volume reduction. So not only are we dealing with different time frames and three key races I'm going to deal with, but men, um, women, boys, and girls are also going to peak differently also. And that's something you have to consider um, along with this. All right, so look at 800, 1600 meters, or 1500 meters, whatever, and kind of in that order. So your your middle distance type of runners, these can also maybe be a 400 meter runner um, mixed in there too, but not distance runners. Because the mileage for these runners is going to be lower than in longer races, you know, the idea that an 800, 1600 meter runner is going to have fewer miles on them throughout the year, the peaking window is going to be shorter. And that's based on a lot of the aerobic system because they have fewer miles on them. It's a big reason why there's some other characteristics about this race, but that's one of the biggest reasons why the peaking window for the 800, 1600 meter athlete, the ones doing those, is shorter, okay? Typically, the peak characterized by a reduced vol um, total volume, usually it's also higher intensity, can be held for one to two weeks. Really, the sweet spot for here is about 10 days. So if you're peaking these athletes for four weeks, well, they peaked way before the last meet that you're really looking for. You know, you have to play these things out. You know, if you're somebody that you, you're worried about them getting to, say, your state meet or a regional meet or something like that, you're going to have to adjust for it. But wherever their peak meet is, they can maintain a peaking cycle for about one to two weeks. Ten days is typically um, the biggest characteristics. And then how that happens differently between um, boys and girls, um, men and women, is going to also be different. Let's look at sort of in between, more of your, your in track for high school distance type runners, the 3200 meter and then 1600 meter. They could also be 1630, however you kind of look at it, but these are kids that will run a really good 3200 meter and they're going to have higher volume than these kids over here. Because the mileage for these runners is going to be somewhat in the middle, okay, the peaking window is medium in length. Makes perfect sense, what we were just thinking about. There's also characteristics of the race and how it actually works, but that's the overall um, takeaway. Because the peak, again, characterized by a reduction in total volume, this can be held for two to three weeks. So two full weeks, three weeks, if you're kind of doing everything right and you kind of built up their, their mileage and you're doing the right things in, in the peaking window. And again, keeping in mind the different ways that the two, the two different genders do actually um, peak. And now let's look at the 5K, the one we've really focused on a little bit more here. Because the mileage for these runners is going to be quite high, the peaking window is going to be longest. This is for, for high school. If this was also 10K um, for maybe a, a college um, man, it would be something um, somewhat similar to this. Typically, the peak, characterized by reduced total volume, can be held for three-ish weeks. It can maybe stretch out to four. I wouldn't want to get it all the way for four, maybe three and a half weeks, something like that. It's why I always do for myself personally in a situation as I've kind of done this and I know it works for me, and, and, you know, our situation here in, in Tampa, Florida. I always give three weeks for the championship phase, the competitive phase in the cross-country season, and for my distance kids, which I typically are, are coaching them. Um, I never give more than that. A lot of times training theory books say, you know, four weeks for the last phase. I don't like to do that just, again, because of the idea of you start to cut the volume and you're starting these peaking windows. Again, law of training specificity is always kind of creeping around. Um, make sure you're understanding this. The idea of the training session has specific effect on the athlete, which may or may not be desired. How does volume earlier in the season affect the overall length of the peak? Well, we talked about this. The overall um, volume, especially earlier in the season, is going to be lower with these kids. It's going to be in the middle here, and it's going to be highest with these kids. So that is really what's affecting the peak here. And you also need to consider, as I've mentioned this already, how um, does the different way that males and females respond to um, reduce volume affect the peak? Something that might be perfectly suited for, um, for girls or women might be not great for men or boys, depending on um, these different things that we chatted about here. So these are just some of the things for that first point of knowing the race itself that you really need to consider before you start going to these other steps of who you're training and knowing your why um, for the day and, 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 and bigger... Um, bigger time frames also. 
So now we looked at you know understanding more about the metrics of the race and different things that make it up. Um, we can start focusing on the second athlete, knowing your athlete and team, and then your why in relation to it. So what I'll do is I'll show you what I did personally in getting myself my plan ready for the 2018 um, team, um, Morton Boys team, um, team that was fortunate enough to make it back to the state meet for the third straight year. And then I'll take you through you know all all there who they were and the plan I came up with for them. And then I'll do the same thing with the current team I'm working with, the 2020 Wharton Boys team, and see how the plan has to be different, even though what you're trying to do in general prep should be the same, and we're getting ready with, you know, for the same event. So, number one on this team, Trey, um, senior, he'd been running since middle school, so probably about six, seven years by this point, training with me for four years, so nothing was really um, new to him at this point. He responds very well to high volume, loves, he's an aerobic monster. His weakness is overall speed. Okay. Number two, Josue, senior who also been running since middle school, did a lot of triathlons and things like that, training with me for two years, responds very well to volume. He has some kind of mental things. We gotta always kind of keep him um, on, on the positive end of, of thinking about you know everything that can kind of go right. But along with that, he had a lot of speed potential, but it really hadn't manifested itself to this point. So kind of similar to what we were saying with Trey in terms of weaknesses overall speed. A uh, young man named Anthony, senior, who'd also run in middle school, did cross country, and I believe he did track also in middle school. Um, training with me for four years, responds well to high volume, also weakness overall speed. You're seeing a trend develop here. Now, number three, or number four on this team, um, Jared Hamill. Um, Jared uh, is a sophomore at this point, somewhat new to running. Um, he ran for me um the previous track season but he did not run in the cross country season but he'd done some you know local 5ks and things like that so he was somewhat new to running um training with me for half a year seemed to respond well to um high volume his body just needed to mature physically at the time i thought it was that he was not good at speed work because he got really hurt to hurt by um acid levels but um and i'll put this video in the description down below Jared last uh, year in the track season, um, you know, just on base work, hadn't done any um, glycolytic type of work, went 52.98 in a 400. Certainly not going to get to the state meet, but for a distance kid, that's really good. So it just kind of showed, you know, at the time I thought it was an overall speed weakness just like the others, so I kind of was treating it the same way. But really his body just needed to physically mature, and now that it's there, that speed aspect is definitely there for him. Young man named Thomas, sophomore, somewhat new to running. Train, uh, he he'd done also some 5Ks and local runs and things like that when he was in middle school. Um, he did run for us in the cross country season as a freshman as well as in the track season. So he'd been training with me to wait for a year at this point. Responds well to um, high volume. Weakness is going to be overall speed um, with this young man also. So again, you're seeing this trend. Lots of they like volume, not great at speed. Jackson Jr., somewhat new to running. Um, he'd run for me for three years. He came out um, cross country of his freshman year, but you know he never run in middle school. In fact, he wanted to be part of the band, and when he decided he didn't want to be part of the band and came out a couple weeks before our first meet, that was really his first introduction to running. He responds also very well to high volume, weakness overall speed, same kind of trend. This is the one person who's very different in this. Um, Nash Sr. running for me for four years, hadn't done anything in middle school in terms of running, but he has great overall speed. In fact, track season the senior year, he became our second or third best 400 meter runner, has a lot of great speed. Um, early on, he didn't respond really well to high volume. Nash is that kind of classic wiry distance kid. Um, if you just looked at him, but again, he has a lot of speed. He's about six foot seven and about 150 pounds. So early on, he just you know he wasn't kind of didn't have his body didn't have the infrastructures in place to kind of handle the the pounding. But by his senior year, he was able to run 11 mile long runs also. So again, you can see a pattern with these kids. And going into the summer of 2018, I knew there was a very specific focus. These kids had a lot of miles on them. A lot of them you know, maybe six, seven years of training age, if you look, go back to their middle school years, some of them, you know, just Jared was the one that didn't have a lot of miles at this point, but most of them had a lot of miles on them, a lot of great central VO2 max development, moving oxygen from the heart outward. So what I knew I needed to do to, we talked about VO2 max being so critical and who wins the 5K, we needed to target the peripheral VO2 max, targeted VO2 max workouts, intervals um, with them, Basically like the workout I showed you at the beginning, the 5 times 1200 but that team was doing 5 times 1200 about 3 or so weeks into the summer, and they were doing 4 times mile repeats, um, mile intervals at VO2 max, 98 to 101%, by the end of June. 
um, that group could handle it because of all the miles they had, all the central VO2 max development. Also, because a lot of their weakness was overall speed, you're not training speed, you know, or not glycolytic speed, you are training speed um, in the summertime with alactic work and short hill intervals. Just the idea of the ability to get their foot up and down quickly, think of it that way, not speed, was sort of a weakness for all of them. So there was a few more of these types of workouts than I would normally do. And just the normal mix of tempo runs, this group was, you know, pretty decent at tempo runs, um, considering um, they just had a lot of miles on them for the most part. And I knew in the fall time when we got into anaerobic glycolytic work, we needed a lot of hard special endurance one, special endurance two, because of that weakness that a lot of them had with speed to make up for that speed or anaerobic glycolytic weakness um, and to be ready for the round of acidity levels um, that they're dealing with in the race. So now that you see, you know, some of the things I knew about my athletes then and kind of my why for needing for, for a lot of what they were doing in the cross country season, let's take a look at our current 2020 Wharton boys. Again, just looking at um, the, the top seven to this point, which can obviously change, but this at this point, and it kind of speaks for if I were to go to eight, nine, 10, 11 at this point, it's a fairly similar thing that I would be explaining here. We've got our young man, Jared here, um, no longer a sophomore. He is currently the number one on the team. Now a senior running with me for four years, responds fantastically to high volume. He's gotten it for a bunch of years, even though he didn't have a ton of volume on here at this point. He just loves the volume. In fact, we did a long run today um, on July 9th, and it was supposed to be about 90 minutes, about 12 miles for this young man. That's where his aerobic threshold is, about 7.30. And it was a harder place to run, so um, you know, I said, you know, when you get to 90 minutes, you're good, but he wanted to get all the way to 12, so it got to like 92-ish, 91 minutes, something like that. He didn't want, he wanted to get to 12 miles because he responds so well to high volume, he doesn't shy away from it. And he's gotten much, much faster, again, based on that that 5298 from just base work, like I said, he's gotten a lot faster. I would say his biggest weakness right now is economy, okay? Running economy, especially with him. Um, his paces are really fast for his tempo type runs. So this is the one area when he has a, a, a workout that's a little bit rough, it's gonna be more in that tempo type area. So it's gonna be uh, an economy um, weakness at this point, which makes sense. This is the hardest thing to train because it just takes a lot of time. All right, Thomas also still on the team here. Um, senior running with me now for four years. He also responds great to high volume, just like Jared, and as he did um, as a as a sophomore. His weakness is still overall speed. Now he's gotten a lot better at it. When Jared did that um, test on his own, we had a meet that night where Thomas ended up running. It was either 56 or 57 in a 400. It's gotten a lot better. It's certainly not fantastic. It's his overall. It's still his overall weakness, but he's gotten better at it. Um, obviously, as he's gotten you know stronger and, and gone through this for a little bit. Um, possibly economy with him. Um, he usually does pretty well on it, but I think it's something that he can certainly even improve a little bit more, his running economy. All right, now we've got some new names appearing. We've got a young man named David, junior, very new to running. Um, he ran with us in track season last year, um, but before that he had no distance running experience in, in any way. He was more in terms of like, um, he was more focused on team sports and that kind of thing. Um, we were very fortunate to have him um, running, with, um, running with me for half a year now. Fantastic, great, natural capacity for aerobic work, indicative by the fact that he's currently sitting in the number three position, and in a somewhat comfortable number three position on a team that's made it to states here for a couple of years, shows his natural capacity for aerobic work, but his overall speed, he's fast too, it's really an interesting mix, I'm very happy to, to have this young man with, with us um, and, and the team. Um, when Thomas did that same um, 400 meter um, race that I was talking about, he also did it, and he went 56 in, you know, training with us for like a month or two. Um, when we do our fly 30 work, Jared's typically number one, David's usually one or, I mean, two or three. So he's got a lot of natural gifts um, along week with this. His overall weakness is just overall pacing. He just hasn't done, done it enough. And his overall volume, he hasn't been running long enough to have enough miles on them like this group did or these two do at this point. Young man named Manning Jr. He ran some shorter distances in middle school, but middle school around here, it's like three weeks and that's it. So it really is not a big thing. He didn't really do a lot of it. Not the way these kids did. Running with me now for three years. Really should be two and a half years because he did not do cross country his freshman year. He actually is really good at economy. His running economy, his tempo runs, he's really good at. And he's got a lot of speed potential. It hasn't 100% manifested itself yet, but he's got a lot of potential there from some of the other metrics. His weakness, just like with David, is just overall volume. He hasn't done enough miles yet. You're going to start to see a pattern here. Amir, junior, somewhat new to running, running with me for one year. He did do cross country his um, sophomore year, but did nothing his um, in terms of distance running as a, um, as a freshman. 
He's got some really good uh, strength in terms of economy. His tempo runs are really good. Speed potential is there. He kicks like no tomorrow, especially on... It's weird. His his 5K kick, his his two-mile kick is fantastic. It's almost faster than his, his mile kick. It's really interesting with him. Weakness, just like with the other young men. Um, weakness is just overall volume. Hasn't had a lot of miles yet. Ethan Jr., somewhat new to running. Running with me for one year. Joined the team the same time that Amir did. His strength, he's got, he's really, he's got overall um, speed potential here. If David's not number two in the fly 30s, it's Ethan who's number two. So um, he's got a lot of speed, and his economy is pretty good too. I like his um, running economy. His tempo runs are usually really solid, just like the, the last four I mentioned. His weakness is overall volume. And then a sophomore named Matt, very new to running, running with me for half a year. He also joined in track last year. He did football his freshman year in the fall time. Great natural capacity for aerobic work and overall speed, just like David. Um, one of the faster kids in the fly 30s, one of the faster kids when we did the 400. think he may be a middle distance runner here at some point, but again, he's got great aerobic capacity, so I don't want to kind of pencil him in yet until he kind of develops a little bit more. Just like the other ones, weakness, overall volume. So from our three to our seven currently, and again, if I went further down, this would be fairly similar. They don't have enough miles on them. They cannot do the workouts that this group in 2018 did in terms of targeted VO2 max. But Jared and Thomas, they can. They can do VO2 max intervals all day. In fact, they do it fantastically. They almost always do it where they're all in range and they get faster as the workout goes on. So what's a coach to do where you have these two kids that can handle a similar training plan that we had in 2018, but more than half of your team, almost three-fourths of your team, this would not work for. What can you do? Well, this is what I decided to do. And again, it was kind of thinking about the team, the demands of the race, um, and knowing my why. This was what we did. I broke it really up into two halves, two mesocycles for the summer focus for the 2020 team. The first half, we lived with a lot of bulk miles, central VO2 max development for this group, and then the 8, 9, 10, 11, as we kind of went down on the roster, have a, a pretty good-sized team right now, and it's kind of the same thing, to develop central VO2 max um, for these kids. Um, what I did with these two is, all right, you know what, you guys have a lot of peripheral VO2 max from doing those intervals from the last bunch of years, too, but... We said weakness was economy. So what I can do when these kids are doing their tempo runs, I can throw a couple miles for them at critical velocity so that they can get more economical because it's a slightly higher intensity. It's basically your 10K pace so that they can work on something a little bit more so. Um, I didn't do anything. Well, let me not get ahead of myself. So we did that basically from June to this week now, basically the first week of July. The first week of July, we started doing a different thing, second half of um our summer training we started doing the targeted vo2 max work heavy that was really indicative of the whole summer for this group because now this group can handle it because they've had the central vo2 max development um and these kids had had it for so many years so they didn't lose anything in fact they're way ahead of where they were at this point last year so the idea being is if i try to just you know hey guys we're doing this targeted vo2 max work and i don't care if it's horrible for you you're going to get used to it it just doesn't make any sense they're not going to get what they need out of it if i didn't give them this quality um th this this um vo2 max quality to develop in it first in both halves we did our normal mix of hills and alactic work i didn't do a ton of it these kids had a lot of potential for speed maybe thomas could have gone for a little bit more of it but jared definitely has it at this point so i didn't want to do anything more in terms of hills and a lactic like I did in 2018, and the tempo runs were normal just like before. Now, could I have done a couple more tempo runs with Jared and Thomas? Yeah, I could, but if you look at the metrics of the race, lactic threshold, running economy, it's it's important, but it's not critically important for the 5K. It's more VO2 max. So I didn't want to overdo that with them. Just give them a little bit of something here that changes things up with those critical velocity. If I do maybe a four mile tempo, the last mile or two for them be at critical velocity. Now, as we go into the fall for these kids, specific prep, they are going to need the same thing that this group did. But that doesn't make sense, it would seem like, because they have a lot of speed potential. But here's the thing. We're in a very different time and place. Usually, these kids would have gone through the second half of the track season and gotten a lot of special one and special two. Coronavirus, at least here in Florida, originally postponed, you know, put a, a hold on our school year in March 13th, which is right around when we were going to start doing some of this stuff, and then ended up canceling the season. So they missed the hard anaerobic work of special one and special two in their track season so they are lacking that they are missing that to make up for that we're going to do just a little more of it in the fall than we normally would not a ton because cross country it's not you know the most important thing it's important or you wouldn't do it but just kick it up a little bit more than i normally would for teams that have a lot of potential speed um here 
just because of what they miss. So it's not just knowing your team and what their strengths and weaknesses are and how you can kind of get from one place to the other, but it's also, what do they not get here? And I can't get around the fact that they miss that here, so we're gonna probably have to do something similar like we did with this group, but for a totally different reason. This group had that speed weakness, so they needed it. This group simply didn't get it because of what happened in the track season. So those are some of the things that you, you might wanna consider when, when coming up with this with you and your group. So just to kind of encapsulate these points with the two teams, knowing what this group needed to focus on in the summer, lots of targeted VO2 max work because of what they'd already experienced with myself and their previous running experience means I'd better step up the volume on VO2 max interval days and put an emphasis on all reps being in the important 98 to 101% range. I'll put a video in the description down below about general prep on VO2 max intervals. But if I know that, I better do it then. Right? I can't just say, well, I want to work on this, and then, you know, in the middle of July, I'm doing four times thousands. Well, that's nothing. That's like a that's like a newcomer kind of dealing with it at this point, you know? If I'm doing this in July, I mean, there might be a reason you do that. Again, any workout in isolation, but the overall idea is if I'm not stepping up the total volume and getting everything in that range, then I'm missing my why for the summer training. I can't just say I want to do this and then not put it on paper. So that overall why is creating my why for the day. So if I'm doing this, if I decide, okay, maybe well, four times five uh, times four thousand is the right one there, there'd better be a reason, you know. Maybe I I just needed to unload them for a week because they just had a lot of you know really good work and they were kind of looking sluggish or something like that. You know, it's just there could be a why that would happen. But if this is what I'm doing consistently, if I do this all the month of July, well, there's no I did not succeed in meeting this why if this is what I'm doing time and time again. If my microcycle planning, I'm prioritizing something, so this is like for the day, but let's say as I'm planning my microcycle, if I'm prioritizing something else like a tempo run, if I'm trying to make sure I get a tempo run in and I don't have a VO2 max run because I'm prioritizing something else versus what I said should be above VO2 max intervals, then I'm also missing my why for the summer training, okay? So it's not enough to just identify it. You then need to go and using the what you know about the race, who you know, your training, and that law of training specificity, if you know that they need targeted VO2 max and how important that is to VO2 max development and then the 5K and all that, you'll have your why for your individual days, for your microcycles, your overall summer, um, and you'll be on the right track. But make sure that you're not just thinking about this, make sure you can justify it with the workout you're doing. Can you justify times four um, thousands if you're trying to do a work, uh, summer of a lot of targeted VO2 max work? Not really, I mean, it's not even race distance at this point, and the idea is you can do almost nine, almost 10,000 meters of this if you need to. I wouldn't recommend that, but maybe there's a situation that it would work um, for, for somebody and your why. So that's kind of part of it. Now, 2020 team, knowing early that these new kids especially, they needed bulk miles for central VO2 max development. They needed it. They were so low on their volume. They were so new to running. Um, I needed to get them into this, so I better step up the overall volume for long recovery and tempo runs. Okay, it needs to be within the safe range. The long run still needs to be 20 to 22%. Your recovery run still can't be longer than 60 minutes or it's not a recovery run, and I'm not doing seven, eight mile tempo runs. That doesn't make sense. But this team, as I mentioned, got to you know times four miles much earlier. This group got to our maximum extent actually this very week, a little bit earlier than it would have been with this group because they already had so many miles on it. This first week um, or first full week in July where this week we, we got to it a little bit later, um, more like mid to late July. So I better step this up and make it clear the importance of the continuous runs at the desired intensity. Don't have them run too fast on these easy pace days. Make sure it's at lactic threshold on tempo days for those kids that are well, I'll get to that in a second, but the idea that if it's a continuous run, you better not be walking in the middle of this and make sure they know that why as well as me knowing the why for this. And at the same time, those top two, they can add the critical velocity training during the tempo runs to enhance their economy. So they're, the bigger group is getting what they need and this group, um, the top two, is also getting what they need. Once the newer kids have central VO2 max development, we can start targeting peripheral with VO2 max intervals. Top two are already strong at this, so they didn't need a ton of it. We were doing some of these, but we were probably doing times, say, 5,000 or times six, eight hundreds in June with this group, along with a little bit more testing because they needed to, they were getting improvements 
in their metrics much earlier because they're much more quickly because they were newer runners so that was kind of the difference between these two groups the plan for 2020 there's a really you know there's a why behind it and it's very different the why behind it makes this very different. The overall idea of success in the 5K is the same. The, the actual race is obviously gonna be the same. And it would not make sense for the 2018 group to do the 2020 training plan and vice versa. It just doesn't make sense. Doesn't mean that this is not bad. This has made perfect sense for 2018. They got back to the state meet. Hopefully we'll do the same thing here. But the idea being that race is the same, but you better change what you're doing based on the actual um, people that you're training and, and what they need and why you're trying to get them to that point. All right, key points to wrap this up. Know the race demands, most important. If you don't know what the race demands, even if you know the athlete, you know, everything about them, you've trained them for a long time. If you don't know the demands of the race, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't. Again, that that, that um, situation I talked about before, fantastic half marathon training is not necessarily gonna get you better in the 5K, right? Know the demands of the race. Knowing basic metrics and more detailed info is like knowing the answers on the tests, okay? You know what the demands are. You know what has to be there. So for the 5K, you know you better have a really well-developed VO2 max because that's going to decide who wins and loses. But not knowing this is like studying for Spanish to get ready for a chemistry test. It doesn't make any sense. If you don't know the demands of the 5K and you're actually getting them ready for the 800, that's like studying for Spanish when you're trying to get ready for a chemistry test. It doesn't make any sense. You would never do that. So why would you do that in racing? Know the demand of the race first. Secondly, know who you're training, knowing who they are, what they respond well to, and what needs to be worked on allows you to tailor your workouts for the day, the microcycle, and larger terms to fit the demands of the race. So you know the demands of the race, who am I training? How can I make it work? That 2018 team was still running the 5K like the 2020 team that I'm working with right now, but how we have to get there is gonna be a little bit different based on what they need, who they are. Okay, and know your why. Daily, weekly, and beyond. I know what my why is at the different points here of the summer. I know what my weekly why is. I know my daily why. In fact, what I do is to make sure that the kids know it too, as I mentioned, always sort of knowing it, I always at the beginning of practice ask who would like to explain why we're doing this today. Explain the workout, why are we doing it? Um, and I really like to kind of hear their answers to hear you know, how much of it they've actually gotten, hear it in different ways too, kind of helps their teammates. Um, this kind of important thing. If you can't say why you're doing a workout, you know, and I want my kids to be able to say why they're doing it, not just me telling them, you need to reevaluate what you're doing that day. Okay, you better be able to know why you're doing it. Even more important, when planning the phases, okay? You have to know what you're trying to do with each phase, what's really kind of critical there. Otherwise, you need to go back and take a closer look. And lastly, understand that law of training specificity that's always kind of around all of these other parts, the plus one. Just because you're doing a workout doesn't mean you're getting better. Just keep that in mind. You better make sure you understand what specifically you're training, the demands of the race, all those different things. Just because you're doing a workout does not mean you're getting yourself better. If you're training an adaptation that is negative for the race, like say, if you're getting ready for the 10K and you're just working on really hard, you know, 400 meters, I'm trying to get my 400 meter time down as quickly as possible, it may or may not actually help the race. It might hurt you in terms of hurting aerobic capacity with a lot of ass development, hurting mitochondria, all these different things you have to kind of consider, right? Um, what's uh, this idea of training specificity? It's based on the race demands also the athlete and why you're doing it so all these things kind of all it's like a it's basically like a circle right you get these first three things in in hand and the law of training specificity kind of links them all together as you're kind of doing it and then you'll have a much easier job of planning for all of this because you really can answer that all important question of knowing your why why am i doing this you can answer that with all these things in mind you're on the right track knowing your why for all of your season training um, is a really critical part of um, success. You know, not just guessing if it's gonna be right, um, hoping you're gonna have success, but knowing, I know my why, I know why we're doing this, we have a real targeted plan, let's go get it. So if you like this video, please think about liking or subscribing. Um, if you have any questions, please ask them in the comments down below. I'm gonna do a video now um, in the next day or two on how you can do intensive tempo, special endurance one, special endurance two, probably two different videos, one on special one and special two um, for the cross country season. So look out for that. And then when I have those workouts done, I'm gonna go through a workout uh, video or a video that talks about 
how to plan out your micro cycles in specific prep, a longer cycle, typically more like nine days, and how I do it, it's usually a two-step process for me. It might help you as you get closer to the specific prep phase. So until next time, this has been Coachy TV.